So we yeah, definitely want to make a reference yeah. to our conference that we're having October 7th. One day. Day full of information, spiritual information. This opportunity to bring all your friends, family, uh, co-workers, anybody that you think uh, could benefit from the message of salvation and the understanding of it, even if they are saved, understanding it in a manner that they can express it to other individuals. We want to get the word out. Um, the address is, is listed here, 4219 Genesee Street. It's across from the Buffalo Niagara International Airport. Um, it's a very new facility. It's called the A-Lofts. They have a conference room that they are state-of-the-art. It's really nice. We are trying to put our best foot forward as it pertains to a, an assembly to show um, individuals uh, uh, to, to create an environment for individuals to come out to be comfortable. We're going to um, we're going to feed them everything totally totally that day. So we hope and pray that they can come out. And um, it'll be from either about ten o'clock to five o'clock. It's going to be a full day thing. So um, try to make sure they set aside a day. And uh, we, we we pray that God can be glorified in that day as well. Any other questions or comments? Um. One more, I guess. Mike wasn't able to make it this morning because you're still dealing with issues with his brother. So keep that in prayer. Absolutely. Um, I guess Crystal invited us out to Ohio next weekend, so we won't be here. Okay. And then my surgery is coming up on the 20th. We've got a lot of events coming up yeah. soon, huh? <laughs> Mike is preaching so, at a different church. They asked him to preach down there, so that's three churches. Young Mike? My, Your my son in law. Amen. Praise God. Yeah. Keep the message going. We pray, pray for the good sound message and someone gets saved by it. That's yeah. definitely our plan. Or come to the night of the truth. Either way, we, we can rejoice in what God is doing. Mm -hmm. Any other um, announcements or prayer requests? Mm -hmm. I also would like to make reference to uh, my mother-in-law. Keep her in prayer while she go through her health issues as well. And keep me in prayer. Some of you know I'm invent, uh, embarking upon a business venture that's been taking me out of um, Sunday sometime. I can't make it um, because this is that season where we're doing the trade shows and trying to go out and really get our product out there. So I ask you to keep us, my family, in prayer as we begin to just go out and uh, try to get some of these things out. Uh, Get, get them publicized, so to speak. So we definitely keep them, ask us to keep us in prayer with that. Any other announcements or prayer requests? If not, I'm going to ask uh, Deacon Jeremy to open us in prayer. That's right. <clears throat> Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you now for this day. We just thank you, Lord, and praise you for all you provided. We thank you for your death, for our sins, your burial, and resurrection. We thank you, Lord, for the gospel that's so simple that we can uh, share with anyone and it applies to every single man, woman, and child. We ask, Lord, for blessing for each one here and their families. Lord, you know our infirmities, you know our needs, and we trust that you're ministering to us, and that you will give us wisdom in all things. I pray, Lord, for the people who are in the path of this hurricane. I ask for safety for them and protection. I also ask, Lord, for salvation, that at this time that they will turn to you and hear the gospel and believe it. I pray, Lord, for our leaders, that they would be saved as well. Yes. We might live a quiet and peaceful life, and all God is nice. Thank you, Lord, for this message. I pray you would bless Pastor Leroy, give him wisdom and insight. And I pray that we would grow to be more effective for masters for you. In Christ's name. Amen. 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 Um, 2 Corinthians uh, chapter 1. <laughs> Second Corinthians chapter one verses three and four. Second Corinthians chapter one verses three and four. Mm -hmm. If you had to say amen. 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 Let's read. Let's be God, even the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of mercies, and the God of all comfort who comforteth us in all our tribulations, that we may be able to comfort them which are in any trouble by the comfort wherewith we ourselves are comforted of God. Amen.
Amen. Today we're going to look at this topic based upon suffering and comfort. It's a contrast that we have to often um, take a take a mindset of, and this is a great time that we do that. There's so much going on in the world today that people have um, been asking this question. I've been hearing this question kind of cycle um, around quite a bit as of late. I'm going to draw your attention to it. And it's, it's been asked various ways, but I tried to uh, pretty much capture the highlights of this question. Um, the question goes something like this. is why would a loving God cause slash allow good people to suffer bad things? You, you, you see, you, you kind of see where we're going with this. There's a lot of things going on in the world today. And because there's so much going on, you kind of hear a murmuring, so to speak. And I've been hearing this type of question kind of stem itself up, and I've been hearing it um, in my place of business. I've been um, I'm hearing it and kind of seeing um, some some um, effervescence of it in, in social media, so to speak. So I thought it would be a timely uh, thing for us to kind of evaluate the question and, and, and the whole purpose behind the question and, and where the heart of the question comes from so that we can be effective ambassadors for Christ because this is the type of a question that really should have some type of response to it one way or the other. Um, and I think that by answering it or by trying to at least deal with it, we can um, uh, be beneficial to, to, to individuals. As spokespersons for Jesus Christ, we're often speaking on behalf of what God is doing in the earth today. People want direction, and, and oftentimes they ask questions because they want an answer to it. And they ask questions because sometimes they are suffering and they want comfort. And sometimes the comfort is getting the answer to the question because now they have somewhat of a, a basis of something to stand on. So we pose this question and we want to deal with it from a vantage point of exactly what God is doing today. Now, I want to classify some of the things as it pertains to the question in and of itself. And one thing, I'm going to go work with this backwards, so to speak. But this bad things, we want to qualify this. Because it's kind of broad, right? Mm -hmm. We want to qualify what the bad things are because I've seen so a lot of different variables on what people perceive the bad things to be. I have a few listed here, but if you have some additional ones, every bad thing that's imaginable. But I want you to kind of like fill it, fill in the blank. I filled in the blank with a few things here. Untimely death of a loved one, right? Um, some of us have had family members that died just man out of the blue. Uh, you know, I've, I've suffered three deaths within the last year and a half, so to speak. Uh, people very important to me, and, and that can really shake you if you don't have, you know, a good foundation. So untimely death. And even um, with, before death, the prolonged illnesses that are attached themselves to death. You have to have, <coughs> ever had to care for someone or seen the debilitation uh, of the deterioration of a, a loved one right before your eyes, that, that, that mother or that grandmother that you took care of, you see them losing their memory and you're trying to bring things to their attention and they can't really focus back or they can't take care of themselves the way they used to take care and then now they're really relying and leaning on you and you see this deterioration effect in their life and it saddens you that, wow, this, what, what is going on? You know, so many different things. Uh, victims of unnamely atrocities, you know, Atrocities, examples like murders, a victim of murder, uh, rape, molestation, child abuse. You have people that have gone through these things in their life, and sometimes they never even bring it up. They kind of keep it hidden a secret. I know a lot of families, the thing took place, um, things used to take place within a family structure, and they wouldn't go to the police. They wouldn't tell anybody, but the child, the, the little girl, the little boy would be victimized by that, and it would stigmatize them for the rest of their life, even until today, because they haven't really dealt with it in a manner that brings them any closure or any type of comfort in their life. So they're still suffering through some things, and this type of question poses itself based on that. Why would a loving God call slash allow good people to suffer bad things. So we're trying to classify and just bring forth some of the bad things so you can see where the scope of this question might go. Natural disasters. That's something that's prevalent. We're praying for the individuals in Houston that have already gone through a, a very traumatic situation down there, a, a loss of life and different things. We're praying for the individuals down in Florida that may be getting ready to go through something that's going to be devastating and, and, and the things that go on with that. Oftentimes, what we find out that people, especially after um, natural disaster stuff, they have to consider their financial loss that's going to occur to them, their assets, 
their property damage and even a, a loss of life. That has to be a consideration because all of those things are, um, are possibilities in, a, in cases like that. Uh, also, in, in this time that we live in war, the possibility of war, the, the, the rumors of war, the terrorism, just the rumor of a war or the possibility of a war for some individuals, they can't sleep at night because they always consider or are concerned whether or not they're going to wake up and a, a bomb is going to be in the air or something like that. So we live in a time that this is a high probability we see <coughs> from what we hear, propaganda, only God knows. But And then the terrorist, that's the terrorism that is taking place all over the world, and mm -hmm. you really can't escape it. You don't know where it might stem its ugly head at. So when we're talking about the victims of these things, you see how a guy over in Europe somewhere, I think he came out, they're not even using guns, they're using knives and stabbing people, you know, just all kind of vicious, savage type things that are happening. And some people, you know, seem like innocent victims to some of this, and the question stems, why would a loving God cause slash allow good people to suffer bad things, okay? Now, we see this, I wanted to just cut... Um, somewhat qualify the, the, the idea of what bad things are so you know what the bad things are, okay? We look at the question. Now, anytime we get a question as a member of the body of Christ, you want to evaluate the question first. Okay, this is what we do. We look at the question because the question is going to give you a lot of information. The Bible says, from the abundance of the heart. I want to tell about, I can tell, I can reach and look into a person's heart, so to speak, based upon what's coming out of their mouth. Now, this is, on, this is on the board, but this is a question that somebody asks out of their, the abundance of their heart. And they let me know some things about them, write them by the question that they're asking, okay? So now when we begin to understand that as members of the body of Christ and an ambassador for Christ, I'm a spokesperson for Christ. That's what I do. I'm supposed to tell people um, what God is, uh, uh, try to give a, a person evaluation of what God's view is in a particular area such as this. Why would a loving God cause slash allow good people to suffer bad things? Now, I'm going to kind of answer, answer, just touch something generically before I even get into the details of this. First and foremost, the person or whatever, whoever asked this question, they made a statement about this loving God or they're, they're, they're inferring God's love. And they're contrasting God's love with what? Circumstances. Circumstances. Yes. The circumstances are those bad things, right? They're, they're contrasting. They perceive that God's love is connected with the things that are happening around them. Whether it be perceived to them to be good or bad, they perceive that if it's bad, why would a loving God allow bad things to happen? Now, I don't want to get too deep into that particular issue, but I want to, I have to say something. I can't just bypass that, right? I have to say something because I'm a spokesperson for Christ, and by virtue of me being a spokesperson for Christ, I have to be a spokesperson for God, what God is doing today. Yes, we have to let individuals know if they ever question the love of God, right? If they ever question the love of God, we have to let them know how God displayed his love to the world today. We want that to be without question, right? A lot of people are familiar with a very, very uh, profound verse um, that's found in the Gospels, John 3, 16, right? It says, For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whosoever believeth in him shall not perish, but what? Have everlasting, Have everlasting life. So some people can just scope from that and they say, well, for God so loved the world that he gave his Son. But they don't see how that deals with their particular situation, right? Okay, but why would he allow bad things to happen? Well, we look over here at Romans, the fifth chapter. Let's go over here to Romans 5. Very familiar. This is more up to date, or this is what, uh, how we um, prescribe or tell individuals about God love today, how we know that God loves us, not only those that are saved, but those that are not saved. And we want to make this known because I'm ambassador for Christ, and I need to let a, a world know that this is God's per, um, uh, uh, extension to you based upon what we already know he have, him to have done. Uh, Romans 5 and 8 says, but God commended, that means God demonstrated or showed his love toward us, and that while we were yet sinners, Christ did what? 
died for us. We want to first and foremost let people know that, listen, don't you evaluate God's love based upon your circumstances. God's love is not attached to the circumstances or the events of this world and what's going on in this world. God's love towards you has already been fully demonstrated by the fact that he allowed his son Jesus Christ to die for your sins. That's God's love expressed to you. Now, once you accept, uh, accept that and believe that particular truth, you enter into a whole other realm of his love, but you need to know that that's God's love expressed to a dying world. They need to know that. Right? Now, when we look at a question, this is something that we have to begin to evaluate. I know that oftentimes when you hear something, sometimes we'll just jump right off the handle, but we have to start watching things. We have to really, the first time you hear a question that's asked by any particular person, right, you want to recognize whether that person is saved. saved or what? Unsaved. unsaved. So I don't write unsaved on this side. That's the first thing you want to do because how I respond to a question is going to vary whether or not I know this person be, is saved or unsaved. You recognize that? This is what we have to evaluate. So now I need more information from that person. That person's given me enough information for me to know even if they are saved, I know that they have not. If this person's saved, now the issue is he needs to come <clears throat> unto the knowledge of the truth. And that's the thing. So now, look, look at my posture now. As an ambassador for Christ, now I'm either being evangelical and preaching the gospel. That's what I'm doing here. The unsaved, I'm being evangelical and preaching the gospel. That may, I might not even get to the question. I have to be evangelical and preach the gospel. Or I'm teaching doctrine. If the person is saved, my duty now is to teach doctrine. Because now I recognize that this person has the ability, based upon 1 Corinthians, to understand spiritual things, mm -hmm. and this one doesn't. Yes, sir. So it would be a waste of time for me to try to express spiritual things to this unsaved person that is going to answer this question. I need to first and foremost preach the gospel to them. This one I can begin to... Um, teach doctrine, so to speak. Okay, turn to, to, to Job. Turn to Job, because we're talking about suffering. I want you to just um, take a look at something here for me. Job 31. If anybody suffered in the Bible, guess what? Job did, Job did right? So we're going to talk about suffering. Let's, let's kind of... Uh, Get some information from, from Job. Look what Job, Job says something here. This is some Job 31, 35, and 36. Look what he says here. Look what Job says. You know what Job was going through, right? Oh, that one would hear me. This is Job saying. Oh, that one would hear me. Behold, my desire is that the Almighty would answer me. And that my adversary had written a book. Who is he saying his adversary is here? Satan. Not here. It's not. It's three friends. Nope. God. God. He's saying God is his adversary. You know why? Because God is doing some adversarial to him. He feels though this, this suffering that he's going through. He's saying, hey, look, what, look what he says here. Oh, that one would hear me. Behold, my desire is that the Almighty would answer me and that my adversary had written what? A book. A book. He says, surely I would take it upon my shoulder and bind it as a crown to me. So in the midst of his suffering, he said, you know what? I'm going through all of this suffering and I don't have any direction. I don't understand what's going on. I just don't got a clue why is this happening to me. But you know what? If the almighty God would have wrote a book with some rules and regulations, some instructions, so I know where I stand in the midst of all this suffering, I would be a lot better. 
At least I would know. I would have the comfort of knowing where I stand. I wouldn't have to be so tossed to and fro and not understanding and scratching my head, but I could have some comfort in knowing that God wrote a book and it gives me the answer to how to deal with the suffering that I'm going through. So this is something that we have to recognize here. The, Job writes this information down and he lets us know that, man, you know, the book has been written. Job writes this before there is a book. Right, right. There's no book when Job, so he says this from a vantage point, well, man, you know, God, if you had a book down, I, I could, you know, I'm your boy, you, 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 you know me and you're good, but if you wrote a book, I could kind of roll with you, and, but I, I, my friend's coming over here, and I really don't even know what to tell them. Right, right. They're coming up with all these things and saying, I must have did something wrong. You know I haven't done anything, but, but if you had a book, I could have something to go right back at him with, but I don't have anything. But if you gave me the, the, the rules and how this thing plays itself out, I would have something to say and I would be comforted in knowing this is what God is doing. God gave us a book. We're writing from the vantage point of knowing where the comfort of God is. Right? We're writing from the vantage point of knowing where the comfort of God is. Turn back to a text that we started in. Turn back to the text where we started. Second Corinthians 1. <clears throat> Look what it says here. 2 Corinthians 1, 3 and 4. Blessed be the God, even the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of mercies and the God of what? All comfort. I don't care what comfort you need. God is the God of all comfort. This is not a misprint. Thank you. This is not a misprint. I'm telling you, there's some things that people are going through. And like I say, the, those victims of all those, those crimes and those atrocities, different things, they keep the things to themselves, but they can be comforted even if they don't express it to anybody because of the God of all comfort. I know a lot of people use psychiatrists and, and, and sociologists, uh, 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 you know, all of those uh, doctors from the vantage point of getting in your mind and getting you to understand what's going on. But God is telling us that there's comfort based upon what the word of God says. Look at verse 4. <clears throat> Who comforteth us in all of our what? Tribulation. We have a lot of tribulations. Brother, it's appointed unto us to suffer. Did you realize that? And we're going to go through some tribulations. But we have comfort within the tribulation. We already have, the comfort is already established within us, within the tribulation that we might go through. Now, some of us are more comforted than others based upon what we intake of the word of God. Some of us don't study to show ourselves approved, so therefore when we go through a certain situation in our life, we don't have the comfort that the word of God may give us because we haven't reached that area of understanding, so we're kind of scratching our heads somewhat like Job when the book is already written. That's another reason why it behooves us to study God's word rightly divided because there's comfort in there for you. Amen. In times of trouble, this is going to be your comfort. Amen. But God tells us it's important for us to understand what he's doing so that we'll be comforted for the benefit, for the benefit of us comforting guests. Guess who? Others. Other individuals. Look what he says here. Who comfort us, us in all tribulations that we may be able to comfort them which are in what? Any trouble. Any trouble. Any trouble. Any trouble. Does that take out anything? This is all inclusive right here. Any trouble, we are able to comfort anyone that's in any trouble based upon our relationship with God and our understanding that we have. By the comfort wherewith we ourselves are comforted of God. Turn back to Job. It's another... Another verse in Job. Job 14. Why am I in Job? Are we talking about suffering? All of the word of God is for us, right? We have to use it long. We have to use it correctly, but there's some areas and some, some truths within it that are precept upon precept. They line up with what we're we're teaching here in the Pauline epistles the doctrine that is to us. So look what this says here. A statement that is made is found to be true. Look what it says here. Job 14.1. 
Man that is born of a woman is a few days what? Somebody has to do the math here. God gives us the ability to comfort people that have any trouble. And the Bible lets us know that if we're born in this world, that we're going to have days that are... Are we going to escape trouble? No. When you believe the fact that Christ died for your sins according to scriptures, that he was buried, that he rose on the third day, that God said, you know what, all the trouble is out of your way now. Don't worry about no troubles. I'm going to just take you right over the troubles. Troubles down here, you up here. Don't worry about that. Trouble is coming your way. One way or the other, right? But God has given us something to comfort us through the trouble. And because we can be comforted through the trouble, God has designed us to give us information as ambassadors for Christ to show other people how they can be comforted. So now, this question, we can begin to deal with this question based upon us having the answer for it. God has designed that we have the answer for the individuals in this particular case. Now, I really didn't want to go here, but I still have to deal with the question because the question has to somewhat be evaluated. The question is off kilter. You can't just accept and embrace every question that is thrown at you. They come in questioning the love of God. They come in saying that either God caused it or he allowed it. Either way, he's guilty. You see what's going on here? Mm -hmm. So yeah. that, that, that's, the, that's the mindset of the individual that is writing this, right? But then he says and makes a statement. He says, to good people. So we have to deal with that, right? Yeah. See, individuals in and of themselves think that in some way or form or fashion that they are good people. And that's a big problem. That's a big problem when people pat themselves on the pack or put themselves on a pedestal to a certain extent to think or characterize themselves as being good. We have to go to the word of God. Let's turn to Mark 10. We want to use the word of God just to share because sometimes this is a real, it's a real uh, uh, sly way of, of, of doing it, but we, we want to show individuals that there's certain things that are said that have to be um, checked. Mm -hmm. The question is, why does they happen to good people? Look what Jesus Christ says in his earthly ministry. I'm going to read verse 17 and 18 out of Mark 10. And when he was gone forth into the way, there came running and kneeled to him and asked him, a good master, what shall I do to inherit eternal life? So a gentleman comes up to Jesus Christ and, and asks him, what must he do to inherit eternal life? And Jesus said unto him, why callest thou me good? Jesus asked him, why callest thou me good? Then he says, there is none good but one, and that is who? God. Who did he take out the equation? Man. All man, right? All humanity is taken out the equation. The only one that's good is God. So why would a person even put in their question that there's a good person? That's not even a possible. That, that has to be checked. That, that makes you want to be sympathetic to the person that, that might be going through because you called them good. But the question is not proper. Not according to sound doctrine. There's no such thing as a good person. So we first and foremost want to use that as a teaching moment. Matthew 19, 17. They might not be confident that that verse was really 1917. Same thing, same synoptic gospels. And he said unto him, why callest thou me good? There is none good but one, that is God. But, you know, but if thou wilt enter into life, keep the commandments. So he go reiterates that, that same truth. There is none good. There is none good. Reiterating that same truth. Romans 3.12. Now let's bring it to now. The doctrine that applies to us. Some of you are familiar with this. They are all gone out of the way. 
They are all together become unprofitable. There is none that doeth good. No, not one. I know. We want to make sure everybody knows that there's no individuals that can pat themselves on the back and claim to have any form of goodness, righteousness before God in and of themselves. So when you look in and listen to people's questions, check their question first and foremost. Because sometimes the questions aren't even asked in a manner that they should be presented based upon the sound doctrine that we know to be in place. So that's something that we all often want to make a reference to. You can also look at verses like Jeremiah 17. Somebody say, well, you know, people have good hearts. The Bible says that. What about the heart? Who could know it, right? So there's nobody with a good heart out there. What about, well, you know, some people are just righteous. They do good things. They do right things. Isaiah says different. What does Isaiah say? righteousness is that's that's right no man has any righteousness to stand before God to say why is this happening to me I'm a good person so on the basis of you being a good person a righteous person a person with a good heart none of us could stand to say that that's why we should not deserve some form of um, adverse um, adversity coming in our way or some type of trouble coming our way when the word of God has already told us that a man that is born of a woman has a few days full of trouble that is what's going to happen. That is what's going to happen in our particular life. So we, we know and we recognize that. Good. So now let's look at this. Now we're back to the two different manners in which we address the question, okay? Now, this is something that we all, all want to start taking a look at when we're dealing with individuals. We're so, we as being a, a, a Bible church and people who study our Bibles pretty much on a regular basis, we're just ready to jump at the end. We want to engage in conversation and engage in, in answering questions, oftentimes, sometimes to our detriment, because every question uh, doesn't necessarily uh, incur a response. Every question that somebody asks you, you don't necessarily have to, 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 to jump to answer the question. I remember uh, that verse, uh, Proverbs 18.3. I'm going to read that real quickly. If my brother just brought it up and... Sunday school, but this is a wise something I just wanted to add to the. That's why I wrote it over there on the board. We just talked about this in Sunday school. Eighteen thirteen. Eighteen thirteen. Proverbs eighteen thirteen. Why does somebody call me while I'm preaching? <laughs> <laughs> you want to hang up that? If yeah, if you can, but I'll uh, mess it up a bit. They don't know I preach on Sundays. <laughs> <laughs> Okay. It's so funny to... they ask you a question. I, I was going to go. <laughs> <laughs> 18, 13. Eighteen thirteen. And it lines just right up with what we say. Look what it says. He that answereth the matter before he heareth it, it is folly and shame unto him. This is why we want to evaluate the questions that a person asks. We want to hear it out. We want to see exactly what the question is before we just jump to trying to answer the question. And I find that oftentimes, especially in grace circles, people so willing to hurry up and get in there, man, I got the answer for you. I got the answer. They just want to get in there and get But they never really evaluate whether the person is saved or unsaved. Turn to, um, I, and see, a lot of people don't know this. We know this, but I have to always share with you. Turn to uh, 1 Corinthians because we want to show why that is such an essential issue about whether the person, what do you mean? Just answer the question. Just just answer the question. Why they got to know if they saved or unsaved or saved by your standards or not saved by that standard? Just answer the question. I'm tired of, you always have to put some type of stipulation on If you just answer the question, the question will be answered, and then we'll have the question answered, right? But no, we can't just answer the question because it's futile to answer a question to certain individuals. It, it, it makes no sense to answer a particular question to certain individuals. Let's look at what it says over here in um, 1 Corinthians, the second chapter. Verse 14, for time's sake, we're going to go directly there. I've started verse 12, actually. <clears throat> now we have received not the spirit of the world, but the spirit which is of God, that we might know the things that are freely given to us. That's the believer here, the one that has believed. Which things also we speak, which man's wisdom teacheth, but, but which the Holy Ghost teacheth, comparing spiritual things with spiritual things. Now look at verse 14. This is why we just don't try to answer spiritual questions to unsaved individuals. But the natural man receiveth not the things of the Spirit of God, for they are foolishness unto him, 
neither can he know them because they are what? We can jump up and down all we want to trying to explain, explain and express to them the answer to the question that is at hand. But if they are not spiritual, they will not receive any of it. So it's like putting the cart before the horse. That's why I say we have to recognize whether or not we need to be evangelical, meaning that we need to go forth with the gospel or whether we need to teach doctrine. Because there's two different groups of individuals out there. There's believers and there's non-believers. So if a non-believer, I can see, can you see a non-believer acting this? Absolutely. Oh, Absolutely, yeah. right? That that's that's spewed, that's steeped with non non-believer information, right? So I have to first and foremost figure out, I need to either directly ask them, do you, do you believe the fact that Christ died for your sins according to scriptures, that he was buried, that he rose on the third day? Or somehow get to find out whether or not they're saved before I even address this. Because it's not going to help them at all if I don't address whether they're saved or not. Right? And the other vantage point would be, I could see an individual that is saved asking this question, but if they're saved in asking this question, what do I know about them then? They haven't come to the knowledge of the truth. See, it's God's will that all men be saved. See, there's some individuals that believe the gospel because somebody was at the fair and they gave them a fire and preached the gospel to them or at a garage sale and preached the gospel to them and they became saved because they believed the gospel, but they went back to their denominational church that's not preaching sound doctrine. So now it's there because they're not getting sound doctrine, not, not coming to the knowledge of the truth, and they're still saying things like this. How do I know for a fact? Because I have clients in my chair asking it on a constant basis, why would God? Why, 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 why? You know when I hear why, why, why? You know I know about that person? Oftentimes, if they're in the church, I know that they're either a babe in Christ. Why, 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 why? The answer's here. Yeah. If you're coming to the knowledge of the truth. But if you don't go get the answer, why, 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 why? Why like a baby almost? Because they haven't come to the maturity and the understanding of what God has done in this particular case. And there's a fortress of doctrine that answers this question. This is not a question that we go to one verse. We understand it's because of the fortress that's built, of the doctrine and the understanding that we have. We, we, we can jump out a few verses and, and say a cer certain things that might, uh, might touch it, but it won't answer it fully. The full explanation to it is understanding the body of work, the operation of God, the benefit that we have in the, in the dispensation of the grace of God. So the first thing we would do on this half is preach 1 Corinthians 15, 3 and 4. That's it. Nothing to the unsaved that I don't foolish question. If I engage in that question, guess what it's gonna do? Divert your attention, take down rabbit hole. The Bible tells me what the foolish question is gonna do. What is it gonna do? It's gonna lead to more. How can it not lead to more ungodly? This person is not godly. They're gonna keep spending in their mind things that are contrary to God, and I'm just gonna keep spinning off my wheels. Because they're not saved and can't understand the spiritual truth that answers the question and comforts their heart. They're only looking for comfort. You can't give them comfort because they're not saved. It's almost like this. How many of you have ever gone to a hospital to, to see a loved one or a friend or family member and they're not saved? Yeah. Is it easy to comfort them? No. You ever, it's, it's, it's not easy. I've been in that situation a lot of times. You know, you know, Pastor, you, could you come up and go see my brother? Could you come up and see him? I ain't know. I'm going to go see him. I got one thing in mind. Their only comfort is in the circumstances. It's changing. That, that's all they want. And because classic or traditional Christianity poses that as the answer, now all they really want to hear from me is, Brother, could you lay hands on me, anoint me, or pray for my healing, pray for my deliverance, pray for this to go away, pray for this. They don't want to hear anything about the only thing that's going to give them comfort. 
The gospel is what's going to give them comfort. They don't understand it because I'm sick, brother. Pray for me that God will remove this, you know, the same way he used to deal with them. He's dealing the same way to do today with us type of thing. But they don't understand that, no, that person needs to be saved. So I'm going to come up there and I'm going to preach the gospel. And then why just send him up here? He didn't even want to anoint me with oil or nothing. He didn't want to do nothing. He, he was almost like when we were doing the prayer circle, he was almost like the coldest one in the room. We was really, and God, bring down that fire. Bring down that healing. Bring down your Holy Ghost. Huh? Bring down that. And I'm not getting attached to it, so I'm looking like the coldest one in the room. like Because I know that's not what God is doing. All of that, what the next person is not saved, if that person dies in that hospital room, he's going directly to hell and he didn't get that. And you know this happens every 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 day somewhere. Yeah. Yeah. Because of whatever m a malady or, 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 or a, it, a sickness or illness a person has, they want the healing. And then when they don't get the healing, not only are they damaged by it, but guess who else is damaged by it? Their loved ones that sat there and watched and believed that verse that was read out of James, if the elders of the yeah. church come and lay hands on the sick, yeah. he shall recover. And when he don't recover, they say, why would God allow loving, loving God cause or allow good people to suffer bad things? The question is all the way back over again. Because instead of giving them the gospel, you wanted to try to apply areas of scripture that didn't even apply to them and give them comfort and healing that doesn't even apply to them. You think I wish I could come up here and lay my hands on Jim right? No, you're going to get rid of this oxygen right now in the name of Jesus. We're going to get rid of this oxygen. All right. <laughs> <laughs> don't, you, don't you think? I mean, right. come on. Right. That right. is my prayer still. Right. I would, you know, God just. Right. But we got this. If he has a good day or a bad day, at the worst day, he still got this, and I'm comforted in that. And he's comforted in it, too. And this is why we have to understand. So now I just wanted to get you to understand that because we, before we try to get, you know, I watched somebody, and they was trying to answer this question on YouTube, and oh my, the foolishness that was just coming out of their mouths. Oh, my goodness. Just, it makes your head want to explode. It makes your head literally want to explode when you hear people trying to doctrinally explain this answer to people that aren't saved. Just saying, just fool, just foolishness, just just stuff that doesn't apply to anything, mm -hmm. anywhere, anybody. Mm -hmm. Because they don't understand the parameters by which God deals with them. So we you, we know first and foremost, right? That this person has to be saved. And then once we get them saved. Then we can start dealing with them from this basis. We have to get them from here to here to understand the comfort that God has. Right. So that they won't, we can get the comfort. Remember the comfort? That's where we started at. So they can be comforted like we're comforted because they're going through trouble. And we're going to comfort them through their troubles because we have the comfort through the trouble. And we're going to show how they should comfort themselves through the trouble based upon the doctrine that God has declared the truth to be about all of us. Some of us know it and some of us don't. But we have to bring those that don't know unto the knowledge of the truth. Okay? So now, with that being said, first and foremost, we have to recognize that their perspective has to change. Once you become saved, your perspective has to change. And I'm going to say a lot of verses, paraphrasing them for time's sake, says, be ye not conformed to this world, what? Be First thing has to happen. This person has to change his mind from these earthly things to the spiritual things. Over here. That's the first and foremost thing. And we say earthly things and spiritual things, that's what was controlling the person over here. Over here, they have to recognize that their citizenship is in heaven. Turn to Colossians 3. <coughs> I'm turn the corner a little bit here, and then we'll go into some other things. I'm going to make a very slight comment here and just move on from this. But I like this. Look at verse 3, because this, something changes immediately. Look what happens here. Colossians 3, 1. If ye then be risen with Christ, seek those things which are above where Christ sitteth on the right hand of God. 
set your affections on things above, not on things of this earth. For we are dead, and your life is hid in Christ. When Christ, who is our life, shall appear, then ye shall appear with him in glory. So now we recognize that our citizenship is in heaven. We're not minding earthly things, earthly things. We're down here. We're down here as ambassadors for Christ first and foremost. So it's like we know we're going back home or we're going home. We already sit with Christ in heavenly places. But we're down here on a mission to do something. And it might be a rainy day or a stormy day down here where we're at. But we know that eventually we're going back home. So we can deal with the storms of today. You know, that comforts us, right? So we understand that we're we're comforted in that. We don't have to really consider that so much. I have this note. Let's go here. I just want to read um, 1 Corinthians 2.14. I have that down here for some reason. It must apply some way or the other. It's something you get home sometime and you write down notes and you're like, what? Oh, I didn't read. Oh, I already read that. Second, uh, 1 Corinthians 2.14. We just read that. That was uh, the natural man receiveth not the things of God. Okay. Uh, so now, we're trying to get this person to be spiritually minded. Turn to 2 Peter 3.15. Second Peter. We're gonna start trying to bring this together a little bit here. Like, why, what are you going to Peter for? Look what Peter says here. Second Peter 3, 15 and 16. I started doing that because you notice on the tape that really is live. See last week, remember you went. So we want to just try to cut that down because it can be distracting when you are listening to it. Okay, uh, 2 Peter 3, 15, 16, and account that the long suffering of our Lord is salvation, even as our beloved brother Paul also, according to the wisdom given unto him, hath written unto you, as also in his all his epistles, speaking in them things, things which are some things hard to be understood, which they that are unlearned and unstable rest as they do also to the, the, the other scriptures unto their own what? Destruction. Destruction. What I want to take from here is the fact that the that Peter makes a reference to the long suffering of God is what? To our Lord is salvation. These two things are are tied together. Why God is being so long suffering in this particular age is because this is the age in which salvation is being presented to the world. Okay, that hope that a person has that everything on earth be fine and everything on earth correct itself, it's going to be all right. right. And we see in the scriptures where... It's in the marker box. It's in the marker. <laughs> Here we go. We see that that's going to be, it's going to be a time when that kingdom is set up where that's the hope that we have, that is going to be on the, on the earth for a thousand years, all that's going to be... In, in, in great shape, right? Mm -hmm. But unfortunately, it's not the hope of this age. So when people are looking for all this peace on the earth and no calamity and no destruction and all that, it's going to happen. But even with it happening, it doesn't have, it's not a part of the hope that you and I have as members of the body of Christ. The hope that you and I have as members of the body of Christ is that we'd be caught up to be with the Lord in the clouds and forever shall we be with the Lord mm -hmm. in the air. So this is a part of our answer that we're giving them, is that they're talking about this, the circumstances of life here on earth. And we're talking about God sees us through the circumstances of life on earth and gives us a hope that's heavenly. We don't look for that promise of, of, of that earthly hope when things will be in that manner. That's why look over here at um, 1 Corinthians 15. Very briefly, I like this, this passage of scripture here. 1 Corinthians 15, found in the same chapter, 15, 19. 1 Corinthians 15, 19. Look what it says here. If in this life only we have hope in Christ, we what? Don't, don't you see that? If this is all we have to look forward to, this world and its circumstance and the thing that's going to, this is the hope that we have in Christ, guess what? We have all been most miserable. If this is what, but see, this is the hope that some people have. This is why this question comes up. Why? Because they think everything's supposed to be peachy king right here as we exist on the earth today. Not according to the scriptures. Man that's born of a woman are a few days and full of trouble. God has conditioned us to deal through the trouble. 
It's not our hope to be on earth when things do get better. Our hope is to be with Christ in the air. And people don't recognize that because they don't rightly divide the word of truth. But guess who's here to tell them? Anybody that's an ambassador for Christ. Amen? So that's something that we want to know, something we want to recognize, something we want to share. 2 Corinthians 1.7, we already talked about that. 2 Corinthians 1.7, we can read through that very briefly again. <coughs> kind of 2 Corinthians 1.7. Just refreshing in somebody's memory. Maybe they came in late. So now we see that that long-suffering of God, the things that we see there. <clears throat> Grace and peace be to you from God the Father. I'm starting at verse 2. From our Lord Jesus Christ, best be the God, even the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who is the Father of mercies and the God of all comfort, who comforteth us in all our tribulations, that we may be able to comfort them which are in any trouble. And that's what we're doing. Trouble is here. We're appointed to trouble, and we can comfort you through trouble by the comfort wherewith we ourselves have been comforted. Do you see how things reciprocate as members of the body of Christ? You can't comfort me unless you yourself have been comforted. Amen. You see that? So don't try to comfort me if you don't understand the area of Scripture that comforts you. How are you going to give it to me and you don't have it? But if you have it, you can sit down and, Brother Lee, right here. You know, look at this. This is where you, how you get through this. Oh, brother, amen. Brother Jim, that's it. That's how this works. If you don't understand what God's word is saying to you, rightly divided, you don't have the comfort that comes in this age. You're looking for comfort from an earthly vantage point. So we recognize that. We look a little further here. Who comforteth us in all our tribulations that we may be comfort them which are in any trouble by the comfort wherewith we ourselves are comforted. For as the sufferings of Christ abound in us, so our consolation also aboundeth by Christ. And whether we be afflicted is for your consolation and salvation, which is effectual, and the enduring of the same sufferings which we also suffer, whether we be comforted, it is to your consolation and salvation. In other words, it's making a reference to how I have to go through some things. And this salvation is not talking about the eternal salvation. It's talking about how to deal with the day-to-day -day issues that may plague you. Right. And this is why we have to be so effectual in what we do. Because God has designed us not only to be uh, evangelists to those that are lost. But to also help our brothers and sisters come to the knowledge of the truth. And you can't do that unless you're studying God's word and experiencing God's word. And working God's word out. That's how we come to the conclusion of that. Um, verse 7. And our hope of you is steadfast. Knowing that as ye are partakers of the suffering. So shall you also be of the consolation. So you see how consolation, comfort, and suffering works hand in hand. We always want to look at that. Romans 8. Romans 8. Romans 8. Look what we see here. Romans 8, verse 18. This is where we really, really want to start getting aggressive as it pertains to this because he's giving us some truths as it pertains to suffering. Look what it said in verse 18. For I reckon that the sufferings of this present time are not worthy to be compared with the glory which what? You know, that's a part of our hope, right? So now what God has us doing, he has us going, he has us... Um, Observing all the things that are taking place in our lives right now and comparing it or contrasting with the hope that the glory that shall be revealed in us. And he lets us know that it pales in comparison. You can't even compare the little minute issues that you are going through in life with the glory that shall be revealed unto you. How do I know that? Because the birth, that's the only way I know. I have not experienced that. But by faith, I trust that what God's word says about this present time is true. true. And it pales in comparison to the glory that shall be revealed. So when now, I don't even get shook up about things that are happening. This question shouldn't even come out of my mouth. But I understand those that do ask it and where they're asking it from. And now it's just the indicator for me. I'm not getting bent out of shape on how I'm going to answer this question. I hear the great theologians and the pastors trying to figure out how they're going to write a long thesis on how they're going to present the answer to this question. I don't get bent out of shape. Either you're not saved and you're asking it, 
or you are saved, then you simply need to come into the knowledge of the truth. Because once you come into the knowledge of the truth, you're going to be empowered to be comforted through that. So he goes on. Um, for the earnest expectation of the creature waited for the manifestation of the sons of God. Now we're going to tell them some doctrine here, right? We let them know that there's something connected to your hope. And this is going to give you some more information. For the earnest expectation of the creature waited for the manifestation of the sons. Who's the creature? We are. we are the creature and we're waiting for some. We're waiting for this different manifestation of the sons of God, which is called glorification. We're going to get this new look, this new body. But it gives us more. For the creature was made subject to vanity, not willingly, but by reason of him who subjected the same in hope. We were made subject to vanity. We were put in a position where we, all we could be is vain. It, it, it didn't, it didn't, we really, we were put in a position with, with, through Adam. Adam really put us in a position where we really were in, all we could do is hope and trust that God would work something out for us because we didn't have the answer for it. Right. So verse 21, because the creature itself shall be delivered from the bondage of corruption, that's us, into the glorious liberty of the children of God, that's glorification, that's what we're waiting for, that's our hope, that's coming, we're talking about it pales in comparison, What's, what I'm going through now pales in comparison to this hope that shall be revealed, this, this glorious liberty of the sons of God that God is going to put on me, but the area of scripture gives me some more information, look what it says, for we know that the whole creation... Groaneth and travaileth in pain together where? Until now. until now. Now you can't always take until now to me until now. But in the dispensation of the grace of God, in this particular case, guess what? It means unto now. You know what it's talking about here? The earth. It's talking about the earth. Not on it's talking about creation. Right. Everything that's created. Look what look what it's saying here. For we know that the whole creation groaneth and travaileth in pain together. You're trying to figure out why there's earthquakes, tornadoes, hurricanes. Because the creation is groaning and travailing together with us. Yes. Sin has caused all these things to spiral. And God is going to sit back <laughs> while he's saving people out of it. Now, and then just letting it run its course. But God is not causing it or trying to make anything happen bad to you, but he's giving you something to condition you through all of it. <coughs> so when people try to figure out why does the earth do all this, why is the, this is it because sin caused the earth in and of itself. For we know that the whole creation groaneth and travaileth in pain together. It's also, we're part of the earth. We know that portion of us, we're brought from the dust of the ground. <coughs> So all of it is coming together, all of it. It says, and not only they, but ourselves also, which have the first fruits of the Spirit, even we ourselves grown within ourselves, waiting for the, redemp for the adoption to wit the redemption of what? You know what the answer to this area is? We were just talking about death. We were just talking about um, aging and all the illnesses and health problems that comes with all that stuff. Guess what? God has an answer for all of that. We don't need to be distressed about that. I'm going to renew you. Let's go through that. I got. You know what? This is not going to give you the full caption of this. But I want to show you something here. <clears throat> I'll do it here. From the time that God created all things to the end. Think about it. We don't even know how much longer time has, right? They say from the time of Adam to now, I believe... The Bible shows me a little more than 6,000. That's what I believe, okay? But, you know, there's, you know they, they, people say a lot of different things. But whatever from the beginning <coughs> to the time God ends everything and, and, and eternity kicks in, we're going to say that this dot that I put here is going to represent it, okay? You see that? So now before God created everything, guess what there was? Eternity. Now, it's all back here too, but I just want to show you that it stops for a minute for time, right? But when time is over with, and it just keeps going, right? So we're going to say eternity past and eternity future, right? You get that? 
Yes. You know what we have here? We have a perspective. Now we can compare. Now, you, you see what I'm saying? So you, we have a perspective. Somewhere in that little dot is your whole lifetime. This is all of time as a whole, but somewhere within that little dot is your whole life. Turn to Luke, Luke 16. I love this, I love this truth that God, Jesus Christ, told here because people say it was a parable. In fact, we were talking, I had to convince somebody last week that no, it's not a parable. This is a truth. Jesus Christ gave us a glimpse of uh, eternity, so to speak, here. Look what it says here. Luke 16, we'll start at verse 19, right? The, people need to know this, this story here. In fact, for time, so let me get to it. There was a certain rich man who was clothed, uh, clothed with purple with fine linen and fared sumptuously every day. He was a rich guy. He just had everything that life desired, right? Mm -hmm. And there was a certain beggar named Lazarus, which was laid at his gate full of sores and desiring to be fed with the crumbs which fell from the rich man's table. Moreover, the dogs came and licked his, licked his, his sores. And it came to pass that the beggar died and was carried by the angels into Abraham's bosom. The rich man also died and was buried, okay? And in hell he lifted up his eyes, being in torments, and seeing Abraham afar off, and Lazarus in his bosom, he cried and said, Abraham, he said, Father Abraham, have mercy on me, and send Lazarus that he may dip up his finger tip in water and cool my tongue, for I am in tormented in this flame. But Abraham said, Son, remember that thou in thy lifetime receivest thy good things, and likewise Lazarus evil things, but now he is comforted, and thou art tormented. And besides all this, between us and you, there is a great gulf. So they, they that which would pass from hence cannot, neither can they pass unto you that could from thence. So I'm going to stop right there because you get the heart of where we're going here, right? Look what happens. Jesus Christ lets us know that two individuals die. So when they die, guess what? They're no longer in time. They're going to be in the eternal place. They're in the eternal state. They're going to, you know, turn. So now one goes, the Bible says, to torments, right? Mm -hmm. And the other one goes where? Abraham's bosom. Abraham bosom. It represents what? Heaven. Heaven or paradise, so to speak. And why I want to bring that up? Because during all of his lifetime, which again is only represented by a small fraction of that dot, because this dot, dot represents all of history, right? So some, and this is a true story. God gave us the benefit of a true story. This is not made up. This is not a parable. This is really, really, really what happened. So this man lived <laughs> all his life sumptuously. He had everything his heart desired. He lived, he just had it all. He was a rich man. He had all that this, all the pleasures, all the joys of this life. And another man, in comparison, had nothing but trouble. Sick, dogs licking his wounds, begging for crumbs during his whole lifetime. But now the perspective changes. He's out of this very temporary fragment, small little inch fragment, few days of time to a place where he's never going to leave. And on this side, he's comforted. But on the other side, this person is in torments. What does this make you want to do? What does this make you want to make sure you have in place before you reach here? Salvation. Your salvation, right? <clears throat> That's why salvation is what we have to preach. Because we know the perspective. I'm not really concerned about trying to tell you that thing which is going to comfort you temporarily here because, first of all, there is no temporary comfort for you. I need to get you in a place where you have the eternal perspective of comfort. And if you have the eternal perspective of comfort, guess what? You're going to be comforted in here. Yep. This lasts for eternity. This lasts for a few days. I don't care if you got riches or I don't care if you, you're in poverty. 
It only lasts for a few days. Perspective. We have to understand. Let's go a little further. I want to deal a little bit more with this here. Oh, come on. Somebody messing with the time. <laughs> Somebody definitely came back here and pushed this time on. There's no question about this. It was just 10.30. Okay. So maybe if I stop going on tangents, I can stay on tangents. But I have to deal with a couple of these. Okay, turn to uh, Philippians 4. Now, I'm just giving you my parameters. You, you can build this fortress any way you want. But the, what comforts me, how I'm comforting other people, is what brings me comfort. And this is why everybody's ministry is different. The way that uh, Pastor Scott might preach, this is going to be different the way I might preach it because what comforts me and I can really bring to the forefront, I'll make a note of, and what comforts him, he might make the note of. You know? So I like this verse, Philippians 4, 11 and 3. 11 through 13. Philippians 4. But I rejoice in the Lord greatly that now at the last your care of me hath flourished again, wherein you were also careful, but ye lacked opportunity. Not that I speak in respect of want, for I have learned in whatsoever state I am, therewith what? I know how to be abased, I know how to abound. Everywhere, in all things, I am instructed both to be full and to be hungry. Both to abound and to what? Suffer need. Suffer need. I can do all things through Christ who which strengtheneth me. You have to understand, in Christ, you have the ability to be content in no matter what situation that you're in. That's what you're really designing yourself to do. You're designing yourself to be no matter what the state is, whether I lose my home, whether I lose my car, whether somebody dies in my family, whether somebody, whatever the case is, I have a place where I can be content because there's some information that I know that keeps me in a place of contentment. I know to abound. I know how to do when everything is fine. I know how to do when things seem like they're being a little destitute. I know how to deal with them. Why? Because in Christ I can do all things through him that strengthens me. It's not my, because see over here is my understanding. But in Christ, I have a better way to scope how to deal with certain issues that are in life. So now the loss of wealth or possessions are in their proper perspective because of this truth that has been made real in my life. Let's turn to Philippians 1, 21 to 23. <laughs> Philippians 1. I'm going to let you out of here. I just want to go through a few of these verses to get them on tape. Philippians 1, 21 to 23. This is, this is mine. Yours might be different. I just want to share with you how I look, how I can comfort myself and hopefully someone else can be comforted. We're dealing with this question about how, how, why would a loving God cause and allow people, good people to suffer? And we dealt with some of those issues in that question, but we want to definitely deal with exactly how we would um, build that fortress of doctrine within ourselves so that we will understand how to deal with these issues. Mm -hmm. Philippians 1, 21 to 23. For to me to live is Christ, and to die is gain. But if I live in the flesh, this is the fruit of my labor. Yet what I shall choose, I would not. For I am straight betwixt to having a desire to depart and to be with Christ, which is what? How can you begin to threaten me with whether my life is going to end or not? When I, for me to die is gain. If I'm living, it's Christ. If I'm living, it's my labor, it's my service. I'm still working as an ambassador for Christ. I'm doing what I'm supposed to do. But guess what? The moment I die, it's gain. He says, I'm betwixt between the two. I'd rather be with Christ because he had a glee. I'd rather be there. But if I'm here, it's fine. You see the contentment there? Yes. We have to recognize and understand so, in the first portion, we develop spiritual contentment in the first portion. And then in the second portion, we recognize that our physical lives and our purpose is primarily for the labor and the service of God as ambassadors for Christ. Verse 29. 29. Let's read there. In the same area of Scripture. Mm -hmm. yeah. For unto you it is given on the behalf of Christ not only to believe on him, but to also what? Suffer, Suffer. Suffer for praise God, brother. Suffer for his sake. Oh, praise God. You see what we're saying here? Suffer for his sake. That's what it's given to us for. It's given to us for the purpose of Christ to suffer for his sake. 
And guess what? If one suffer in the body, guess what happens? We all suffer. We all suffer. Is anybody exempt from suffering? No. So if we all suffer with him, guess what? We all reign with him. Your reigning has nothing to do with whether or not you actually in, in, embarked upon suffering. Somebody suffered the body and we all suffer because it's collective effort. Praise God. I'm going to close with this verse. Let's turn to Romans. Turn to Romans. I got plenty more, but I might pick up next time I get a chance to teach. I love that this question is still, we might have more devastation and we might have to revisit this. But Romans 8, this is the, this is the closer for me. Mm -hmm. Romans 8, okay? 8.28. I quote this almost in every case. Some people look at me like, how can you just keep quoting that? That fit every, it almost fits every case for me. Romans 8, 28. And we know that all things work together for good to them that love God, to them who are called what? You have to recognize in and of yourself that you are called according to his purpose. How do I know that? I believe the gospel. If you believe the gospel, you're called according to his purpose. And if you're called according to his purpose, God is now orchestrating in your life that everything you go through, no matter whether it looks good, looks bad, all of those full of troubles that we talked about, all of those bad things that we listed out, if it's in your life, the word of God says that it's going to work together for your good. So I don't care how my health looks. My, I'm going to deal with my health. I'm going to go to the doctor. I'm going to pray and ask God, man, this, shake this off for me a little bit. But at the end of the day, at the end of the day, I recognize that whatever the state I'm going through, I'm going to be content because God is working this out for my good. He doesn't mean any harm to me. It's working out for the good of the purpose on which I've been called. My calling is an ambassador for Christ, so it's going to work out for that. Some individuals, it's a, Bible, it's a, a believe it's a book. Who wrote the book, um, Don't Let Your Cancer Go to Waste or something? What is that? It was a Richard Jordan, Don't Waste Your Don't Cancer. Don't Waste Your Cancer, exactly. That, it's talking about how you go through certain things in your life and we waste them because instead of rejoicing in who God is through them, we're just hunkered up and just and dealing with the problems like the world would deal with them. Yeah. Oh God, why me? Why why would you allow this to happen to me? Instead of like, in spite of this, but I'm I got cancer, but I'm here today, y'all. I'm trying, I want you know I want y'all to rejoice in the fact that y'all don't see me next week. I'm be I'll beat y'all to the Lord, but I'm gonna be there, you know. This is the type of attitude we should have because we're not of this world. Our mindset should be different than those that we shouldn't be saying the same things that these people say. This person shouldn't ask the same question that an unsaved person would ask. But if they don't know, that's what they'll do. And that's why those that of us are strong have to bear the infirmities of what? The, the of the weak. The weak. The weakness is the, the lack of knowledge of the doctrine. Any comments or questions? Good. Hey, uh, Everything that God does brings him glory. So when he left heaven to come over here and be born a baby and that stuff, it brought him glory. When he died on that cross, it brought him glory. When he saved you and everybody else, it brings him glory. Now, when he looks at the whole thing, it says, Our light affliction, which is for a moment, and work it for us a far more exceeding way to glory. So the glory that he's getting working through you and your suffering, giving you the comfort that comes from the Word of God Amen. so that you can comfort others in the same circumstances <coughs> of bringing God more glory. So our Lord affliction, which is for a moment, they work for a far more exceeding way of glory. We're going to share a greater amount of glory in eternity because we're bringing Him more glory right here. You're dead in life and Christ. Amen. Praise God. Praise God. Excellent. Excellent. Go ahead, brother. Man, that was so special. That, that, that was so powerful. Those verses we looked at, Pastor. I, I, I miss this so much. Romans 15 and 4. Romans 15 and 4. Those passages that we looked at in Job was, man. Romans 15 and 4 for whatsoever things were written aforetime were written for our learning that we through patience, and here go the word we're looking at today, 
and comfort of the scriptures might Amen. have hope. Amen. Absolutely. So, I'm, I want to make this about us and not about me as members of the body of Christ. Us, when we get here on Sundays, and one of the things I miss, it enforces, for edification's sake, it enforces our awareness of what we have access to in Christ. Amen. Enforces our awareness. It does something to our mind to build a confidence up in the word, power, and work of God. And it, it, it verse almost brought me to tears what Job said in Job 31 concerning if he had a book, <laughs> what we have, surely I would take it upon my shoulder and bind <laughs> it as a crown to That's it. Right. It, it. Week after week, day after day, the confidence that given ourselves attendance to reading the word of God rightly divided, it really does and should enforce the awareness of what we have access to. Amen. And makes us aware of when we're not taking advantage of it. That's right. When we're not applying it. And I just wanna I just wanna say I'm 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 so grateful to be surrounded in this atmosphere. As we are enforcing the awareness of the word of God rightly divided it and uh, man. Amen. Thank you. Praise God. Absolutely to God. That was a great message. Yeah, sure. This time, you know, it's so necessary because uh, you see it already. People coming out saying about how it's the wrath of God on people for what they're doing, you know, the storms. Just like they did, you know, the previous time. It's all the same thing. Amen. And you got the people who are coming out there sort of, you know, Christians, right? Mm -hmm. Moments of Christians, the same thing. And that comfort that we're talking about, the only way that could be legit, like, it's actually going to work, mm -hmm. is if it overcomes everything, everything. Watch out. That's the only way. That's right. Because it only overcame a few things or, you know, not to the fullest extent, mm -hmm. it wouldn't. But it overcomes everything, Every Satan's devices. Amen. It overcomes our fears. It overcomes the circumstances. Mm -hmm. It has to comfort us in, like I say, in all things. Amen. And uh, the sufficiency is there, and the, and the doctrine is there for that. So this is a very timely, very timely Praise message. God. Praise God. Mm -hmm. And something, you know, you can go so many different variables with this particular message, but when you're talking about... Um, a person making a reference to why would a loving God cause or allow uh, bad things to happen. <clears throat> First of all, anything bad thing that God was going to do to mankind as a result of their sin, like they're saying that uh, Katrina was a result of the sinfulness and Houston was a result of the sinfulness, we always have to make a reference to the fact that all the punishment that God wanted to put on mankind because of sin was placed on his son Jesus Amen. Christ on Calvary's cross over 2,000 years ago. We have to get that out of the way. They have to know that's where God poured out his wrath upon for sin on his son Jesus Christ because that brings glory to God. Amen. The fact that, look, I poured the wrath out on, I took it out on my son so that I could love you. Amen. I don't have to be mad at you because I put it, I was... I forsake my son and pour my wrath out on my son so that I could love you. And that's why I love 2 Corinthians 5 when it talks about um, God not um, accounting their trespasses unto them. Mm -hmm. People have a state today in this dispensation of grace where this is the acceptable time. And as long as this is the acceptable time, there's going to be some long suffering. God is sitting back because he's trying to get the fullness of us in there believing that gospel. And when that last person believes it, the floodgates are going to open. He's going to deal with the sin. He's going to deal with the calamity. But we have to know because we understand the Bible dispensationally. And it really draws a picture. not whole trespasses against them. Amen. So it couldn't be. Uh, That's right. Amen. He not only your trespass or not. That ain't punishing you for that. Yeah. All minds clear? Yeah, Go right. ahead. I just want to add one thing. Amen. You know, one of the things in. in um, in 1 Peter 3, and I'm going to read verse 15, it says, But sanctify the Lord God in your hearts, and be ready always to give an answer to every man that asketh you a reason of the hope that is in you with meekness and fear. Now, 
obviously there's different hope that they had, mm -hmm. but the principle, you know, be ready always to give an answer to <coughs> come in and ask your reason if you're wrong. Absolutely. Absolutely. That's, like I say, we don't shun because they want to know, you know, and especially things that pertain to your hope. But that's just the thing. You have to make this a hope question. You see? And now you have, you have to transcribe this to a hope question. And the hope question is about salvation. See, I'm not going to deal with a secular question to a secular carnal person. That's not my, I'm not designed for that. I'm a new creation in Christ. God gave me the information to deal with spiritual things. That's just a general conversation. That's going to lead to what? More ungodliness. That's not where we should be. Take it to the spiritual realm. Stay there. That's where the comfort is at. Let's bow our heads. Father God, we thank you for this opportunity you've given us, Lord God. And Lord, each and every person that's represented, every family that's represented here, we just thank you for your Holy Spirit that makes intercession for us with groanings that cannot be uttered. We just ask that in, uh, that you understand all things and, and you, through your omniscience that you reflect a blessing towards each family here. There's just prayers that and requests that may have not been asked, Lord God. We thank you for your Holy Spirit that makes intercession for us with groanings that cannot be uttered. <coughs> that you can deal with each and every topic, each and every infirmity, each and every problem that we have spoken and unspoken, Lord God. And we continue to pray for the leaders and the people that are in power in the government so that we can live peaceably on this earth, Lord God. And we intercede for those that don't know you in the pardon of their sins, Lord. And we just pray that um, in our intercession, Lord God, that, uh, that, that we, we, we're thankful on their behalf as well. For they, they don't know, know to be thankful, but you've given us the instruction that we should be thankful for them, and we recognize why. We pray this prayer in Jesus' name. Amen.